Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. We want to draw your attention to some very important information that has not gained as much coverage as it deserves. We are all at the beginning of a new space race. Several national interests are competing to earn their place in the future space economy. One nation is outpacing all the others, and it is not the United States or Russia. From the 1950s to the early 1970s, America and the Soviets made great strides in space science. Going from copying captured German rockets to improving on the designs and making their own, the Soviets surged ahead with the first lunar impactor, first lunar lander, and first lunar rover. The Americans then jumped to the lead and became the only nation to land humans on the moon, with Apollo 11 landing in 1969. The Soviets had the first probe to land on another planet, Venera 7, which landed on Venus in 1970, surviving the hellish conditions after landing for 23 minutes. And the first probe to land on Mars in 1971. But that probe failed after only 20 seconds. The Americans then abandoned the moon, when Eugene Cernan climbed into Apollo 17 and launched back to Earth. Soviet achievements in space are discussed in this lesson. I say Soviet because nothing Russia has done since the fall of the Soviet Union has been substantially different from previous developed Soviet technology. In fact, the greatest achievements of the Soviet Union were mostly built in Ukraine. Arguably the greatest rocket engineer in history, Sergei Korolev, was Ukrainian. The Soviets gave up trying to land on the moon after the death of Korolev and the failure of their N-1 rocket system. The Soviet Luna 24 did return a 170 gram sample back to the Earth in 1976. The accomplishments of the Soviet space program are in this lesson. The Americans launched Skylab into orbit in 1973, but then abandoned Apollo technology and started working on a reusable space shuttle, launching Columbia in 1981. The Soviets went on to assemble their own large space station though smaller than Skylab, in 1986 and named it Mir, later copying the American shuttle with Buran, which only flew once in 1988. The U.S. planned a new space station of their own called Freedom, but after the fall of the Soviet Union, this became the International Space Station, which 15 countries helped build starting in 1998. But while our old adversary Russia could take part, the American Congress forbade any U.S. cooperation with China in space. That left China on its own. China, with the help of the Soviet Union, had developed their own rockets in 1964 and had launched its first satellite in 1970, first recovering an orbital vehicle in 1975. The snub from the world's spacefaring nations did not go down easily in Beijing, and China launched its first unmanned spacecraft, the Shenzhou-1, in 1999, just a year after the start of the ISS. In 2003, China sent its first Taikonaut into space, becoming only the third nation to do so. China's first lunar orbiter was launched in 2007 and named the Chang'e 1. Chang'e was the mythical Chinese goddess of the moon. Accomplishments came rapidly after that, with the first spacewalk in 2008 and the first Chinese space laboratory in 2011 named the Tiangong or Heavenly Palace. Also in 2011, China successfully docked an unmanned capsule to Tiangong. In 2013, China soft landed a probe on the lunar surface on the near side, becoming the third nation to accomplish this feat. In 2016, Tiangong 2 launched as part of a planned larger permanent space station. In 2019, Chang'e 4 landed on the far side of the moon. All American and Soviet landings to date had occurred on the near side of the moon, making China the first nation in history to accomplish this feat. America, the Soviet Union, and later Russia 
had the technology to do this. They just hadn't bothered. The Americans chose instead to land nuclear-powered rovers on Mars. While the Russians have never really even tried to match the space science accomplishments of the Soviet Union. The decision to focus almost completely on Mars by the United States might be considered by some a historical blunder. Some would argue that trying to establish a viable colony on Mars without first developing and refining the technology on the moon and without utilizing lunar resources is a grave error. In 2020, China did launch an unmanned probe to Mars, but later that same year, they launched Chang'e 5 to not just land on the far side of the moon, but to return a sample. Chang'e 5 was launched on China's most powerful rocket, the Long March 5. This rocket is about 57 meters tall with a diameter of 5 meters. It is a two-stage rocket with a total mass of 854,500 kilograms, which is about 855 metric tons. Putting it between the Falcon 9 at 550 metric tons and the Falcon Heavy at 1,420 metric tons. The Long March 5 can get 25 metric tons to low Earth orbit, and it can get up to 9.4 tons on its way to the moon. The Long March 5 uses four RP-1 liquid oxygen boosters and a central core that uses hydrogen fuel and liquid oxygen, like a smaller version of the much more powerful Energia rocket system the Soviets had flown. We have a lesson on Chinese rocket systems here. The Chang'e 5 Lunar Sample Return System was launched on 23 November 2020 from Hainan Island at 2030 UTC. The entire Chang'e 5 system is made of four components, a lander, a sender, orbiter, and return vehicle. The mass of the Chang'e 5 is estimated at about 8,200 kilograms, or 8.2 metric tons. This mass is low enough for the Long March 5 to make the 11.2 kilometers per second delta V needed for a straight flight to the moon. On its way, the Chang'e 5 made an orbit correction on the 24th of November at 1406 UTC and another on 25 November, also at 1406 UTC. Orbital corrections are necessary, expected, and planned into every mission. On the 28th of November at 1458 UTC, Chang'e 5 entered lunar orbit. The probe fired its engines to circularize its orbit the next day, the 29th of November at 1223 UTC. About eight hours later, at 2010 UTC, the lander ascender unit separated from the orbiter return vehicle section. The lander and ascender worked as a unit to land on and return samples from the moon, while the orbiter and return vehicle stayed together as a unit, orbiting the moon and waiting for the samples. The lander touched down on 1 December 2020 at 1511 UTC, here with lunar coordinates 43.1 degrees latitude and 51.8 degrees longitude. This area is called Eratosinian Mare. The Chinese named their landing site Statio Tianchan. This area had very young, by moon standards, basaltic regolith, 1.21 billion years old, and had elevated levels of titanium, thorium, and olivine. An area like this was never sampled by American or Soviet probes. The lander had a drill and a robotic scoop arm, here you can see it taking samples and depositing them into the ascender, which is on top of the lander. The ascender has a container to hold the samples and it is designed to launch from the moon back into orbit, leaving the lander on the surface. On 3 December 2020 at 1510 UTC, the lander ascender unit had finished its collection mission and the ascender launched back to lunar orbit. The shock of the ascender's takeoff disabled all of the lander's systems as was expected. There the ascender met up with the orbit return vehicle section, docking with it at 2142 UTC on the 5th of December, transferring the samples to the return vehicle. The ascender was no longer needed, and it detached and was commanded to crash into the lunar surface. China gets a lot of flack for its rocket boosters coming back down randomly, but reducing orbital hazards around the Earth and Moon is vital. The ascender fired a deorbit burn on 7 December 2020 at 2330 UTC, impacting the surface at 2249 UTC on the 8th of December. On the 13th of December, at 0151 UTC, from a lunar orbital altitude of 230 kilometers, the orbiter and return vehicle fired four engines to enter an Earth-Moon Hohmann transfer orbit. A Hohmann transfer orbit is usually the most energy efficient way to get somewhere in space. As they neared the Earth, 
the return vehicle separated from the orbiter. On the 16th of December at 1800 UTC, the return vehicle, now with a mass of about 300 kilograms, performed a ballistic skip re-entry, bouncing itself off the atmosphere to reduce delta V, before entering the atmosphere to land. This reduces the load on the heat shield. The capsule landed in Inner Mongolia, carrying 1.73 kilograms of lunar material, 10 times more than the last sample return mission performed by the Soviets. The orbiter performed an atmospheric avoidance burn and used a gravity slingshot maneuver to throw itself to L1, where it will continue to send back data. That all of this worked is an amazing accomplishment for a relatively new spacefaring nation, and belies any misbelief that an authoritarian regime cannot create advanced technology, something we should have learned during World War II. The Chinese set about examining their samples and announced an amazing discovery. Contained in these samples was a previously undiscovered lunar mineral. This was a phosphate-based mineral containing the elements calcium, yttrium, iron, phosphorus, and oxygen, with the formula Ca8, Y, Fe2+, PO4, 7. This mineral is made of transparent, colorless crystals with columns 10 microns in radius. The amazing thing is that this crystal seems to absorb helium-3 into its structure and contains a relatively high percentage of this incredible fusion fuel. To brush up on the importance of helium-3, watch this lesson. But briefly, many fusion reactor designs use deuterium and tritium for fuel. Deuterium is an inexpensive, stable isotope of hydrogen found in all water on Earth, sometimes called heavy water in this form. Tritium is a very rare isotope of hydrogen with two neutrons. Tritium is radioactive and decays in just 12.3 years. What little we find on the Earth is recovered in mines from the radioactive decay of uranium. Tritium costs about $30,000 per gram right now, and these fusion reactors will need a lot of it. It might be possible to produce tritium in fusion breeder reactors, but deuterium-tritium reactions produce neutron radiation, the worst kind, while deuterium-helium-3 reactions do not. This type of fusion is aneutronic, making helium-3 the perfect fusion fuel to combine with deuterium. And the moon has enough helium-3 to power all of human civilization for centuries. While current law does not allow anyone to own any part of the moon. 3D printing a large fence around a giant area of helium-3 deposits will keep anyone else from entering your base without permission, giving you something almost as good, control. The first nation to harness the power of helium-3 will also be able to get to Mars in just 30 days instead of nine months, opening up the entire solar system to rapid colonization. Something to think about. Thanks for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and stay safe at Astro Proterra. <laughs>